Wow, thank you so much. What an introduction. Good morning, church. Hi, good morning to everyone online. I am so blessed and honored to be here with you today. Um, I was actually telling Heather before I got up on stage how nervous I was to come and share because he was my youth pastor. Like, this is such a full circle moment for me. Today, my husband and I are youth pastors at a church in Richmond called Hilltop Community Church. We've been there for eight years now, ministering to the young people there in the Richmond and Bay Area. And so I'm, I'm so incredibly excited to be here. Um, we've been talking about this. He invited me a, a few months ago. So I've had quite a bit of time to pray for all of you and to pray for our time together. And I just want to thank the worship team for ushering in the presence of God this morning. That was such a sweet time. I got lost in it, in the worship. It was so wonderful. Thank you for sharing your giftings to usher in God's presence. Um, I just want to brag on your pastor for a minute. Scott came into my life at a very formative time in my relationship with God. I was newly accepting Jesus into my life, although raised in a Christian home. But it was through Scott's ministry that I was discipled, so I really came to know God personally. It was through his ministry that I got called into the ministry and knew at a young age that God wanted me to be a pastor someday. He wanted me to lead people to Jesus. And so I just want to say to you, church, you have the best of the best in the Tuttles. You really genuinely do. And um, I just want to, if you wouldn't mind putting up the pictures from Relentless, I have some throwbacks for you. Here's some throwbacks. I know it's kind of small, but um, if you look closely, you will see pictures of Scott in there, but don't look too closely because you might also see me, which might be a little embarrassing. Um, and then if you'd go to the next slide, we were at each other's weddings. Like we have done a ton of life together. And I'm just so thankful to have grown up under your ministry and now to be here sharing with your church. It is such an honor and um, a full circle moment for me in my relationship with God. So thank you very much. And I just want to encourage everyone, um, again, that you have the best of the best in the Tuttles. They are teachers at heart. They're passionate about teaching people um, about God, the things of God. And we need that. We need that firm foundation in this world, this crazy world we live in, right? And not only do they teach it, but they live it. And they exemplify it every single day. So I, I'm sure you know that. I'm looking at your faces. I know that you know that. But I just encourage you to draw near to them. Allow them to just continue to disciple you and teach you the things of God. And with that, I would like to dive into my story. It was our first wedding anniversary, my husband and I. And... I began to notice that something wasn't quite right in my body. I, I wasn't really sleeping. I was up a lot at night, coughing a lot. Just um, I'd fall asleep and then wake up gasping for air. Um, I had just this cough that wouldn't quit. And no matter how much like cough and flu medicine I would take, it just would not go away. There was no let up of this thing. And I was absolutely miserable from not sleeping for days and days straight. Um, and I just felt terrible. So my husband and I, we began to pray and we asked God to show us what was wrong with me. God, what's going on here? I'm a relatively healthy person up till that point. Um, I had never really had any health issues, never really had to go to the doctor for much. So we thought it was something basic, but we did what anyone does today. If you want to know anything at all, I Googled it. Yes. And no matter how we would put my symptoms into Google, the same word would come up. And I had never heard this word before, but the moment I heard it, I knew that's what it was. The word was lymphoma. I knew the moment I read it that it was cancer, and that's what I had. But it wasn't until December, months and months and months later, after countless doctor's appointments, trying different medicines, um, CAT scans, x-rays, blood work, surgeries. It wasn't until months later and tests later that it was finally confirmed. 
Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer, and it was advanced. I had a baseball-sized mass in my chest, pushing on my heart and my lungs. My doctor told me that if I didn't start treatment right away, that I was going to die. So my response was, when do I start? And I started pretty much immediately. In January of 2016, I started my treatment. Today, I'm going to share with you what God has revealed to me through having stage four cancer and how I trusted him in the midst of the most desperate, life-altering, darkest season of my life. And I'm believing that after our time together, that we will all walk out of here encouraged and empowered to have a stage four kind of faith. So when I talk about having a stage four faith, I'm referring to the kind of faith that with storms, the most terif- that withstands the most terrifying storms, the darkest of seasons, the most trying situations in our lives. You may not be facing cancer today, but all of us go through difficult things. Amen. The fact is that in this room, there are two types of people. Those that are facing a stage four kind of situation right now, and those that are not facing one right now, but will be. Whether you're going through a trying time right now or not, you will be. That's a fact of life. Am I right? I mean, it's not something that we like to say, but it's just the truth. I started my treatment the Tuesday after my birthday. We figured out that Heather and I have the same birthday, January 7th. So I will never forget, though, the Tuesday after my birthday, I had 15 treatments of chemotherapy over a 12-week span, followed by 20 radiation treatments. That's every day for a month. So we actually lived at Stanford in Palo Alto. And I don't know if you know anything about cancer treatment, but that is a very aggressive form of cancer treatment. We just hit the ground running. And in the beginning, I really didn't want to share with anyone what we were going through. Did not want to tell anyone. I didn't want the opinions. I didn't want the advice. I just wanted to handle it, right? Just wanted to get through this season of my life. But God began to work on our hearts. And we knew that God, in order for God to be truly glorified through it all, we needed to share what we were going through every step of the way. We needed to let our friends and family know. We needed to let our church family know so that people could pray and so that God could be glorified through it all. So all throughout the journey, I had complications. I had allergic reactions to medicines that no one in the history of ever has apparently had allergic reactions to. I had complications in surgeries, had to spend the night in the ER, took a trip in an ambulance, felt horrible most of the time, as you can imagine. I lost all of my hair after only my third chemo treatment, and I slept days and days and days away. We had a really rough go at it. But halfway through my chemo treatments, things got worse. Bye, Macy. (laughs) See you later, girl. Um, Oh, that's my mine, by the way. I don't know if I said that. She's mine. Um, I have another one at home, too, almost three-year-old. Anyway besides the point. Okay. Halfway through my chemo treatments, things got worse. I started having shooting pains in my hips and my chest that would just make me buckle over in pain and take my breath away. My doctors knew what it was right away, but they sent me for a scan just to check it out. I went in for an x-ray and what we had feared was confirmed. I had stage four cancer. Next, they sent me for a CT scan which is different than an x-ray, and I'll explain that in a minute. They sent me for an additional CT scan to see clearly how much the cancer had spread in my body and to what I only assume to tell me how much time left I had. We went home from that doctor's appointment feeling like we were in the darkest of days. Could not be any lower. Questioning God, God, we serve you. God, we trust you. We've, we're sharing our journey with the world. Like, what are, what are you doing, Lord? This is terrible. And we had no idea what was going to happen. So the next week, I went in for my scan. And in order to have a CT scan, 
if you've ever had one of these, then you know you have to get an injection in your arm of something called nuclear glucose. It is essentially a dye that is attracted to cancer in the body. So it highlights cancer in the body through the scan. Now, usually when you get this injection, you're in a room with 10 or so other people who are having the same thing happen. You get the injection, you lay there, you let it circulate. Everyone just kind of lays there. Um, but what was strange about this day, I was feeling particularly awful that day and really, really depressed in a bad mood, not only feeling bad physically, but emotionally. And I was in this room by myself with a bunch of empty beds around me. That has never happened then or since. And I've had so many of these scans. I had my injection and the nurse walked out of the room. And I remember looking up at the ceiling tiles. I can still in my head remember what that looked like. And I remember just praying to God out loud and saying, Lord, I'm so done. Would you just take this from me? I believe that you can. So would you? But even if you don't, I will walk through this whole thing knowing that you will heal me, that I will live and not die, that you will be glorified through it all. And then the nurse came in. I went in for my scan. I was still feeling terrible. Nothing magical happened in that moment. Um, but I had a peace when I was in the machine getting my scan that knowing that I'd have to walk through this whole thing. I'd have to go through all the chemo and radiation but I believed with everything in me that God was going to heal me. The next day was about 7.30 at night. It was a Wednesday, a youth night. So I was home because at that point I was too sick to be around crowds of people. My husband was at church with our youth group. And I got this phone call. Uh oh, no, oh, there it is. I got a phone call from a number that I didn't recognize. And it was my doctor calling from his personal cell phone. Now, doctors do not call from their personal cell phones, <laughs> right? Um, so I was nervous. I was like, this is not good. But he called and he said, Hannah, I just couldn't wait to tell you the results of your scan. There's been a complete metabolic response. And I responded with what maybe the majority of you in here are thinking. Um, huh? <laughs> God, um, or doctor, I was like, in English, please. <laughs> And he laughed and he said, that means there's no cancer to be seen in any of the images. And I said, so I'm cancer free? He said, Hannah, you are cancer free. I couldn't wait to tell you. We still want you to go through the rest of your treatment. So you have to finish out your chemo. You have to finish out your radiation because the way that the mass was attached to my heart and my lung, they couldn't remove it for fear of, through surgery, through fear of puncturing my heart or my lung. So the chemo and the radiation would shrink the mass as much as possible because it's like scar tissue. So there's no cancer in it, but the tissue is still there. And I think slide. So there you go. On the left, the cancer. On the right, no cancer. There it is, the miracle. <clears throat> so in order to be unafraid, in the midst of life's trials, we have to have faith. But what is faith? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11.1 1, that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. In essence, faith is trusting God no matter what, no matter what life throws at us, no matter what comes. So with that in mind, how do you trust a person, right? Right? How do you put your faith in a person? Well, you know who they are. And when you know who they are, you know if they can be trusted or not. And how do you know if you can trust somebody? Through close relationship. Through close, close relationship, you learn a person's nature. I was able to have a stage four kind of faith because I know God's nature. In my life, I've gotten to know God's nature through studying his word through spending time with him, through growing through life stuff with him, through being discipled by pastors like Scott Tuttle, through studying God's word, I see that God always keeps his promises. Through his word, I found that he is consistent. What he does for one, he will do for another. Through his word, I find 
that he loves us and wants only what's best for us. And through his word, I have learned that he is the God of the impossible. And I believe that everything I'd experienced in my life leading up to going through cancer had prepared me for cancer. God taught me in seemingly small ways and at a young age that he could be trusted. He made me resilient. He cultivated my faith so that when the true time of testing came, I was ready. As soon as you accepted Jesus into your life, he began cultivating your faith as well. And maybe in seemingly small ways. But what I've come to realize is that trusting God with the day-to-day -day small things really isn't small at all. It's preparation time. He uses it all to prepare us for the plans that he has in our lives because he sees the full picture. He is constantly developing us and shaping us and our faith. We all want to see miracles in our lives. Amen? But none of us want to go through anything hard. Amen? <laughs> but in order for me to have experienced the miracle of God's healing, I had to be really sick. I knew that he was someone who could be trusted with this seemingly impossible task because he had never let me down before. I knew that he wouldn't start letting me down now. I want to encourage you that when you're going through the darkest, most desperate times of your life, remind yourself of God's nature. Remind yourself of who he is in his word. Remind yourself of what he has done in your life, of the times that he's answered your prayers, that he delivered you out of something, that he healed you of something. Let these reminders strengthen your faith to believe that if he's done it before, he will do it again, and he'll do it again, and he'll do it again, and he'll do it right now. In order to have a stage four kind of faith, we also need to know God's promises. At the beginning of our journey, God promised four things to my heart. He promised that I would live and not die, that he would heal me, that this whole process was less about me and all about what he wanted to show the world, and that ultimately he would be glorified through it all. And I held tight to these promises all throughout the months of being sick. I had to remind myself of these things daily. Has God whispered promises to your heart today? And maybe the promises whispered to your heart seem absolutely impossible. Don't give up. Don't let up. God, you've promised this to me, Lord. Remove my doubt, Jesus, in this hard season. Remove my doubt, Father God. I trust you and your promises that no matter what, you are a, a God of your word. God revealed his promises to me through his word, through the Bible. When I was sick, I compiled a list of Bible verses that I would just pray over myself every single day. And to be honest, there were some times I'd get stuck on one single verse. I'd have some doubt when I'd read it. And I'd just have to speak it over myself over and over and over again until I began to believe it. There were days when I continued to struggle and so then I just, I had to post it on social media or something. I needed to like take that extra step of faith to believe that his word was true. On my list, reverse is like, I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. That he is wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Those were on my list. God's word is powerful and effective, and we cannot take this lightly, church. God's word is a weapon that he has given us to overcome the enemy. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. So why don't we use it? Before this season, I know I took God's word for granted. I would read it and be like, oh, that's really nice and encouraging. But what I've come to realize is that it's not just a book. It's not just a compilation of encouraging things. It's our lifeline. On Christmas Eve... Before I began 
my treatment. Um, they only did four surgeries that day, and they put me in as one of those surgeries. I was so thankful. Um, but there was a complication in my surgery. And when I woke up, I was uncontrollably coughing, and there was all this junk coming up, and I just couldn't breathe. They couldn't even put an oxygen mask on me because every time when it was on me, I'd just cough up all this junk. And my body was completely out of control. I was just, it was out of control. It's convulsing and everything. And I just saw nurses and doctors running around the room and heard machines beeping and going off all around me. And everyone looked scared. One of the nurses ran and grabbed my husband. And when he came in the room, he just stood at the foot of my bed, like eyes wide. I must have looked just crazy. <laughs> but I did the first thing that came to my head when all this started happening. I just started quoting out loud every scripture verse I think I'd ever heard, every worship lyric. You know, I probably threw in Jesus wept in the beginning, you know, anything, just whatever came to mind um, I, in between coughing. I will live and not die. <laughs> By his stripes I'm healed. <laughs> just over and over and over again, every verse. It brought some peace, but when Matt came in, in between coughing, I just said, read, <laughs> Bible. <laughs> and he said, what do I read? And I said, anything. And I have no idea. I, to this day, I don't remember what scripture he pulled up on his Bible app. Um, thank God for Bible apps, right? You have it. You have God's word in your hands at all times. Um, he just started reading God's word to me. And as he was reading, a peace came over my body. And I was able to breathe easily. And for the first time, I saw and I felt the power of God's word in my body, in my life. And everyone in that hospital that day saw it as well. So I encourage you, make a list. Hold tight to those promises. Remind yourself daily, especially when you're doubting. Read them over and over again. Pray God's word over your life because it works. In order to have a stage four kind of faith, you need to know whose faith you can pull from. There are times in our lives when our faith is so weak and shaken that we need to pull from the faith of others to keep us going. There are times when faith, my faith was so weak that I needed to rely on my husband's faith and encouragement and it strengthened mine. There were times when um, I had to rely on my family to pray for us, to encourage us, to keep us going. And we relied heavily on our church family and our youth ministry. On Wednesday, like I said, I'd be too sick to go, but the, here's a, a picture of the youth group praying for me, and I'd get these pictures sent to my phone, and it would just encourage me so much and uplift me to, to continue to fight and to believe for a miracle. Their passion, their fervent prayers gave us strength. Sometimes we feel like we have to or want to go through difficult things alone. But I encourage you to be vulnerable. To make your needs known to God's people. I encourage you to get plugged in with a Bible study. To serve the church in some capacity of ministry. Because surrounding yourself with God's people those are people who will encourage you, uplift you, lift you up in prayer, go to war for you in prayer when you need it most. Their support with God's help will carry you through. Whose faith can you pull from today? The next thing that I realized through this whole process is that the miraculous is easy for God. This is the absolute biggest lesson that God taught me through everything I went through in this season. And the one thing that I think would absolutely transform the way any of us approach God or approach the difficult times in our life, if we truly understand this. We don't have to beg, scream, struggle, or fight with God or try to convince him to do the miraculous on our behalf. He wants to do it. He can do it. He's God. It's easy for him. The question is, do we believe that he can? Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Our God is the creator of the miraculous. He's the God of the impossible. 
It's who he is. It's what he does. What is hard and impossible for man is easy for him. Just one touch and we're never the same. One touch from him and my cancer was gone. So let's stop begging and begging and begging for God to do things on our behalf. And let's pray with 100% confidence that he will do it on our behalf. What, is hap- what would happen if we as God's people stopped trying to earn God's favor and blessing and started living like the children of God that we are, knowing that he's already offering it to us, that it's already ours? You may ask any- me for anything in my name and I will do it. John 14, 14. Ask and it will be given to you, Matthew 7, 7. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by their Father in heaven, Matthew 18, 19. Have you asked him for a miracle today? When you, be- when you ask, believe with 100% confidence that the miracle is already yours, that God is already working and moving in ways that you cannot see. And it might not be in our timing. It might not be in the way that we thought it would be. But his plans are higher. His plans are better. He sees the full picture, and he's working it all together for our good in ways that are better than we could ever hope, ask, or imagine. When you ask to be used by God, church, you will be. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Being used by God does not look the way that we want it to (laughs) or that we think it should. Being used by God sometimes comes in disguise. And let me tell you, when stage four cancer was a really good surprise, God. (laughs) My whole life, I've asked God, God, I want to be used by you. God, make an impact on this world through me. I never, ever expected through cancer. Everyone wants to be used by God. Everyone wants to make an impact. But sometimes in order to do that, it means we have to go through really hard things. Opportunities to be used by God come in disguise. (laughs) But what I also want to share with you today is that God does not make these bad things happen to us. God sees the bigger picture and will allow difficult things to happen because he knows the outcome. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy brings the bad. But God promises that he works all things together for his good. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. While at Stanford, we had the opportunity to pray for a woman named Lindsay who had an extremely rare disease. In fact, Only three people in the entire world have ever had this disease. So everything that the doctors tried for her were completely experimental. And nothing was working. Her cousin, a friend of ours, called us and said, knowing that we were living at Stanford at the time, he said, my cousin is here. She's not a Christian, wants nothing to do with God, won't let us pray for her, but can you just, like, find her hospital room and stand outside and pray over her hospital room? Because the doctors have given her two days to live. So we found her hospital room not knowing if she was going to let us in, not knowing what was going to happen. And she let us in and her whole family was there, her parents, brothers and sisters, her children, her husband. And I have never seen anyone so close to death in my life. Her skin was gray and the, the feeling of death and sadness was just tangible in the room. It was thick in the room. But God used us that day to be atmosphere changers. We shared stories about doctors and nurses that had us all laughing because we could all relate. Um, We brought the joy that day. We shared my story. And then she gave us the opportunity to pray for her. And we kept it short. Sometimes we feel like we have to, like, drag it on and on with God. Remember what I said before about begging God to do things? Well, I'm telling you, this was a really quick prayer. And then we left. And um, a couple months later, I was kind of curious, what happened to her? So I reached back out to her cousin, and I said, hey, can you give us an update on Lindsay? And he said, oh, Lindsay, oh, she's great. And he sent us this picture. She was all packed up and moving home from Stanford for the first time in months. 
I keep up with her on Facebook, and she's still healthy today, living her life. She owns her own business, completely healed by God. And all throughout, yes, give it up. Thank you, Jesus. All throughout our time at the hospital, God was using us to minister to doctors, nurses, fellow patients, all people that we otherwise never would have encountered if we weren't in that season and in that place. This reminds me of Joseph in Genesis. And the story begins in chapter 37, where he shares with his family a God-given dream that God gave him. Now, I'm not going to read. Don't worry. I'm not going to read the whole thing. (laughs) I encourage you to go home this week and read about Joseph in Genesis, because it's a really cool story, the way God works all things in his life for his good. The dream. He had a dream that all of his brothers someday and his parents would bow down to him, meaning that he'd be in some kind of authority over them. Well, they didn't like this so much, so they plotted to kill him. They sold him into slavery. As a slave, he was wrongfully accused by the wife of Potiphar, the person who owned him, and so he was thrown in jail. Time passed, and again, I wish I could go through the details because it's so cool, so please go read it. Um, But the king had a dream, and the people in the prison knew that Joseph could interpret dreams. So they called on him to come. He interpreted the king's dream, and because of this situation, the king had favor on him and appointed him second in command. No one but the king was more powerful than Joseph. So you see what the enemy meant for Joseph's destruction, the Lord was using to position him, to prepare him, and to move him towards his calling. Genesis 50, 20, Joseph says to his brothers, who he later comes in contact with again, that what you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what now is being done, the saving of many lives. God's word promises us in Romans 8, 28, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that he uses just the easy parts or the good parts. No, he uses the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen. Yes. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom of God. He uses it all to propel us in the direction of his plans, to position us for his glory and to make an impact. So I want to encourage you today in the midst of your stage four situation, the thing that the enemy has meant for your destruction to take you out, God wants to use to propel you to his good. And at times it's going to be really, really, really hard, church. But you have to go through the storm in order to have a testimony. And your testimony is meant to be shared. Your testimony is not just for you, but instead to point others to Jesus. People are starving to know that God is good. They are starving to know that he provides, that he loves them no matter what. They're starving to know that he still answers prayers and that he is still in the miracle working business. And you, church, are the ones to show them through your testimony. People will argue all day long if God exists. They'll argue all day long about religion. But what someone cannot argue with you is what you have lived, what you have seen, and what God has done in and through your life. I work in the secular world. I work at Gap Inc. in San Francisco, Um, you know, the clothing brand. Uh, So if you shop at any of our stores, thank you. Um, I work at Gap Inc. And I can't even tell you how many times I've had the opportunity to share my story and my testimony. And being in that secular world, not a single person has ever said, that didn't happen. That's not true. Instead, they stand in awe of God's goodness, in awe of God's healing power. And then what I say after I share my testimony is I say, what God has done for me, he will do for you because he loves you just as much as he loves me. Revelation 12, 11 says that we triumph over the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So be bold, church. Be bold. Share your testimony with others. And you will triumph over the enemy. And you will be used to make an impact for Jesus. So in closing, in order to have a stage four kind of faith, and let's be honest, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We're all in a stage four kind of situation right now. Am I right? We're all going through a really difficult time. 
And then on top of that, we have personal things we're going through. It's a lot right now. But you can weather this storm by knowing God's nature, by knowing God's promises, by knowing whose faith you can pull from, by believing that the miraculous is easy for God, and by knowing that when you ask church to be used by God, you will be right where you're at. And no matter what you're facing, you will be used in your neighborhood. You will be used in your workplace, in your family, in your church, in your community. God will use you. So now I just want to pray with you today, church. God, I'm just so thankful for this time. Thank you for bringing us here to this place, God. We don't take it lightly that we get to be in your presence, God. That we get to to worship you here in your house today. And we thank you for technology, God, that the people at home get to worship you as well, Lord. I just pray, God, that this word would solidify in our hearts, that we would be encouraged, God, that the difficult things that we're facing today, we are not alone in God. You're in the thick of it with us, even when it seems like you're silent even when we're frustrated because you're not doing things the way that we want it done, God. You are working on our behalf and you love us and you never stop loving us even for a moment. There's nothing that we did to make you start loving us and there's nothing we can do to make you stop, God. We're your children, Lord. And so we believe, God, that you have your promises available to us today. We believe that your miracles are already done on our behalf and you're offering them to us today, God. So we receive it, Jesus. I just pray right now, God, that you begin to speak to hearts, God. Maybe some of us are in here, we're like, I haven't felt the whisper of God's voice in so long. God, would you just begin to whisper your promises to us? Would you just begin to reveal verses in your word to us of your promises in, in whatever season we face right now? God, right now, if there's anyone in this room and you, yourself, or you know someone who has cancer right now, would you just raise your hand? Dear Jesus, we just lift up all the individuals in this room represented by the people here, God, who have cancer, who have this sickness in their bodies. Lord, I believe that you have anointed me to pray for them and that they will be healed, God, because what you have done for me and my body, Jesus, you will do for them, God. Right now, I know, I have seen, I have experienced one touch from you, and they're healed, God. It's completely gone. And I pray that these people will come to know you if they don't already because of this, Jesus, because of this thing happening in their body, because of your healing touch. If there's anyone in this church right now who or online who maybe you're facing some sort of stage four kind of situation in your life. It's the darkest. It's the deepest, most difficult season of your life. Would you be bold and raise your hand so that we as a church can pray for you today? Dear Jesus, We're all in the midst of this pandemic together, Lord. These are dark days in our world. I just pray right now, God, that anyone in here who's experiencing loneliness, anyone online experiencing loneliness, God, anxiety, depression, fear, Lord Jesus, because of the events and the things transpiring in our world today, God, I just pray one touch from you right now, Jesus, and you would bring peace. You would bring joy, Father God a full confidence that you've got, even this impossible situation for man, you've got it all under control, Jesus. And I pray that you would lead us and guide us through it. Help us navigate our world the way you would have us. Help us to be the brightest, bright lights and the strongest, strong salt in our world today, Lord, because our land is desperate for it. Would you heal us, God? Heal our land, Father God of this sickness. Heal our land of all the things that divide us and separate us, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would use us 
as your glue of love to bring people together, that you would use us as your vessels to work through, to lead people to you. Set up divine opportunities in our workplace, in our home, in our community, even at the grocery store, Lord Jesus. Divine opportunities for us to tell people about you, to share our testimony, whatever it may be, with the people around us, to be bold so that we can see people come to know you as their Lord and Savior and have relationship with you. God, I just thank you right now for the Tuttles, Lord Jesus, as they lead this church, as you've placed them in this community. God, would you continue to speak to their hearts? Give them direction for this community, God. Give them direction. I pray that you would give a, a, a double anointing of your Holy Spirit on them, Father God. That all the places that you place them, Lord Jesus, in the community, that they would be atmosphere changers, God that you would highlight people to them that they can minister to, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will bring people alongside of them to support them in the vision that you've given them, God, to accomplish the plans that you have for this community, Lord Jesus. Provide for their every need, I pray, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for this time, God. Thank you for this church. In Jesus' name, amen.